she captures, you know, the spirit and the personality, creativity, the generosity that goes on in that in in that room. I just knew that has to be in the book. I said, Elizabeth, how about you write this book with me? You're listening to Find the Good News, episode 102, The Tumbleweed Tree, a Beacon Series conversation featuring John Wagman and Elizabeth Knight, co-authors of Repair Revolution, How Fixers Are Transforming Our Throwaway Culture by New World Library. Find the Good News is produced by Parker Brand Creative Services, a branding agency that thinks sideways, pushes forward, and gets your brand up. See what else we do at parkerbrandup.com. Sometimes, an episode release date aligns perfectly with a special occasion that makes the content of the conversation even more relevant. As it turns out, my conversation with John Wackman and Elizabeth Knight, co-authors of the new book, Repair Revolution, How Fixers Are Transforming Our Throwaway Culture, would be one of those episodes. Each year as we approach the Christmas New Year season, my mind lingers on the incessant pulling and hauling that is about to begin. The vacillation between the acquisition of shiny new things and the inevitable shucking of used goods, many that were perhaps obtained only a year before. I've struggled through these seasons for a long time, and anyone that has been willing to lend me an ear during this season has probably had to suffer through one of my diatribes about re-sanctifying this time of year, redirecting our energies on peace, mercy, and goodwill towards others, instead of another perpetual round of trinkets and gadgets that will bloat the landfills of tomorrow. My personal practice is something I call secondhand sacred, which, in short, means finding spirit, fresh meaning, and new uses for forgotten, discarded, and broken things. I was happy to find many alignments to this practice in Repair Revolution, and even more during my visit with John and Elizabeth. The crucial element of this revolution comes in the form of repair cafes, essentially gatherings of generous fixers and tinkers, with a variety of expert skills at fixing our stuff. As John and Elizabeth explain, people line up at these repair cafes with their band-aided and broken items. Whether it's a shirt that needs mending, a blender that won't blend, a record player that won't play, or a lamp that won't light, it seems there is no end to the knowledge and willingness of fixers to teach people how to bring their cracked and crooked items back to life. Not only do people get their items repaired, but they learn firsthand how to make these fixes themselves. It really is revolutionary, yet so simple. This idea that someone can be taught how to make a simple repair, seek out the parts, and extend the life of their utilized and treasured belongings. Beyond the transfer of know-how, John, Elizabeth, and all the fixers and tinkers get to hear the stories attached to so many of the precious items that come through the doors of the repair cafes. There are many items in my life that have moved from simple utility, transformed into the stuff of legend through the life that wielded it. Maybe you have items like this. A sewing machine, a rocker, a hammer, a skillet, or pot. It is certainly easy to click through and have a new item delivered to you. But just because we can doesn't mean that we should. There is a cumulative impact on our environment when we live this way, and I would go further still and say that it also has an impact on our souls. Maybe the repair revolution isn't just about fixing our broken belongings. Maybe it's also about repairing ourselves and the fractured relationship we have with our world. Maybe it's also about repairing ourselves and the fractured relationship we have with our belongings and world. Now, it's time to rethink old habits. Take a pause before tossing something out. Consider the interconnected nature of our world and our place in it. Now, tune your attention to this Good News Beacon and press play on a little good news. Wake up this morning, dreaming up the story I can hear. The way it's going, cause you're laughing in your sleep. On the path to your deliverance and a holy wall of light. Old news, bad news, fake news. Sometimes you want to shut those signals down and seek a better source. With my Find the Good News Beacon series, I tune into good people doing good works wherever I can find them. I scan across the full spectrum of life, seeking out human beings that have turned their dials towards helping others, aligning their time, resources, and talents with goodness, justice, mercy, and love. In each episode, I sync up with the hearts and minds of my extraordinary guests, 
We have dynamic conversations that invigorate the mind long after our transmission has ended. I discover the critical life experiences that shape them, the perspectives that drive them, and the fundamental beliefs that have anchored them to a path of goodness. There's a lot of background noise in the world. My name is Oren Parker, and I'm cutting through the static to find the good. And I love you just you're in a very visual space there. Oh my gosh! Yeah, used to mm-hmm. we had a studio just in the same town where we lived. You know, I had a, like a separate room for everything, and so COVID comes to town. You know, and it's like we just started. We locked locked the doors. You know, we couldn't really do any face to face recording anymore. And as that mm-hmm. just prolonged, I said, "Look, we're just let's just get rid of the overhead and just switch to this method here." And so this little room has sort of uh, is the condensed version of what we. <laughs> <laughs> we had going on in a bigger space. It's a lot of That's fun. Great. Though. Yeah, it's crazy. Is that a Tibetan flag on the ceiling? Yes, it is actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. sure is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I got a Tibetan would... flag back there. Let's see. I'm looking through my camera. Got the peace flag. We got the American flag. There's all kinds of. It's kind of eclectic. Get Captain America back there, and I guess every direction. I'm kind of a. It's all over the place. I'll, I'd give you a 360 before we're over <laughs> so you okay. can see the whole space. Okay. Uh, well, because Elizabeth and I were talking, we're, you know, we're very interested in your, in your background, your kind of your journey as well. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'd love to share anything you guys are interested in. Your book was, uh, I was just telling my wife this, we were chatting mm-hmm. over lunch and I said, this is one of these books where... <clears throat> It gets you thinking about so much stuff. And I got to tell you, most of these conversations I have, I, it's hard to not frame it through the context of what the world looks like down here on the Louisiana coast right now. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, not just because of the hurricanes, but just even culturally, you know, we're we're on a uh, it's just a petrochemical landscape down here. I mean, we're in, you know, uh, liquid natural gas and you mm-hmm. name it. I mean, it's, it's all over. So it affects, I've always thought it affects the way we culturally here, or maybe for anybody who lives in these areas where you have industry right in your backyard, I think it affects the way we perceive our relationship with nature. I really, really mm-hmm. do. I actually think it messes mm-hmm. us up a little bit and I, I'm not even, I, I, I almost can't even say that out loud around here because industry is king. I mean, it's why Mm -hmm. people live here. So when you say things like that, it comes off like you're attacking people's livelihood. Mm -hmm. And y'all got into some of that in the book, too, where you can't replace one thing for another without some kind of consciousness of that because, you know, it does affect people's ability to provide for their family. So there has to be some kind of uh, Mm -hmm. conscious transition that's at least – Aware well, of that's that. a great phrase, conscious transition, because uh, you know we 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 believe that a, a transition is is on is necessary and is underway and will be healthier and will be better. Yeah. Uh, but yes, people need to have a li- a livelihood along the way, and that's this phrase, just transition. Are you familiar with that? The just if this transition must be a just transition. In yeah. other words. It has to bring us all along. It's interesting because I, and I found a lot of this in the book. I, I mean, this whole tone of the way we're starting this conversation. Yeah. My husband's um, cousin was a Catholic nun, and she taught biology in high school and uh, high school kids. And we were going through a very difficult time, and his job got offshore to India twice. And she sat me down and said. Baby girl, I want you to remember, she said, I'm a biology teacher. She said, the only thing that doesn't have to adapt is dead already. Oh, wow. (laughs) That's really, that drives it home, right? I mean, you know, I guess I don't, I've had this conversation a, a couple of times recently, and it's maybe something I've been scratching my head over for at least my whole adult life. And it's, how do you teach this to people i mean on the scale and y'all got into that in the book as well you know on the scale it needs to happen to really really affect change like we really need right now 
You know, how do you get enough hearts and minds to really understand our interconnectivity? You know, our relationship with with our natural world that's so out of balance right now. And I mean, I get we're, we haven't really even dove into the book yet, but I mean, that's to me, that's the core of what that your book was about. Is that is like, you know, we um, we have to start having some kind of a balanced relationship. We don't have to give up our objects and things. We can just we have to think about this a completely different way. Balance is certainly a very good word to use. Uh, yeah. A, a question, Oren, I'm curious to know, when you first saw the title of the book, Repair Revolution, How Fixers Are Transforming Our Throwaway Culture, what was, what was your kind of reaction to the title? I actually got excited. To be honest with you, it didn't take me too long. First, I, I looked at the cover, being in graphics design and branding, I had sort of this, uh, it had this sort of revolutionary look to it, you know? And, I, and I'm and i sure that was with intent that it was like, hey, you know, there's a revolution going on. It definitely had that theme. But as far as the title, I thought, you know, it made me immediately think about regrets, to be quite honest with you. This is, let me tell you a story. And I mean, everybody's probably got a story like that. And, you know, when you grow up in a culture like we have, that's heavily driven by machismo or has been traditionally like with machismo and men have their place and women have their place. And, you know, boys don't cry and women are homemakers. I mean, that's kind of what you I grew up seeing, you know, mm -hmm. down, and maybe not everybody saw that, but I kind of grew up seeing that the dad went to work dad was the carpenter he was the mechanic he was the guy who fixed the plumbing you know and mom did the cooking and the cleaning um and the homemaking and that all sounds well and good but there was a tension within that dynamic that caused lots of trouble but i didn't grow up in a home where that information was passed down my father obviously learned how to work on cars somewhere he obviously learned how to work on the plumbing and to and become a carpenter and and do all the just manifold things that he did and my mother too the sewing and the mm -hmm. the the inner home things that went on and what i found was as i got older i was better at the things my mother did mm -hmm. i could sew i could cook i can clean i could keep a home interiorly way better than i could do anything exteriorly because i that stuff seemed to get passed on to me but with my father it didn't so as i got older i struggled with all the things that men traditionally just seemed to know how to do i had to like really go out and seek the, that education. And so your book to me just immediately made me think of those moments when I was in my early twenties, where uh, let's say I needed to fix some drywall. Well, I'm at a complete loss at that point. Someone says, Hey, you've, you're the one who has to do this. I have zero knowledge, right? So yeah, I had this feeling inside of me that was okay. I, um, this can't be that hard. I'm not an, I'm, I'm a, a fairly, I think, intelligent guy. I figure other things out. So I, I took the approach of if I can figure out how to do this, it's everything in life is just a process of step one, step two, step three. And if I have the right tools, I surely have the capacity to learn this. So I just started going on YouTube and would like YouTube sort of became my father is the way I've, I've worded this to mm -hmm. people. I was like, YouTube mm -hmm. become my dad. You know, when I need to do something now, I just go on YouTube and my YouTube daddy teaches me and I go to the store and get my stuff and I come home and, you know, rewind and pause and take screenshots. And I you know, and I, I, I would say I was never an expert at any of those things, but I could get it done. And I realized that that was really what I liked doing. I liked learning new things. I would rather try my hand at it before hiring someone to do it. And so I guess I'm, that's a big answer. But when I saw your book and the title, I thought, oh, this to me is that right. It's encouraging people to at least for a moment, instead of just throwing it away or reaching out to find somebody, you know, paying tons of money 
just give it a shot. You might learn mm-hmm. something and uh, save some money. And on the top of that, save something from the landfill. Because, I mean, what what kind of world? do I mean, I'm looking at it at right now, just driving back to the studio today for this meeting. I mean, street after street, there are just objects. I mean, televisions, refrigerators, bicycles, couches, chairs. I mean, I can't even go name them. The, this hurricane has left all people have just pushed these things yes. to the road. And yes. I just got to wonder. I know it's all going to the landfill, every every scrap of it. But some of that stuff surely doesn't belong in the landfill. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. big answer. I can meander all over with that. But. Well, but it is true. It is true. My son lived in Houston for six years, and so I visited Houston um, you know, a bunch of times, at least six times. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the hurricane of – or it wasn't, uh, wasn't the hurricane or the very, very heavy rains of just oh, a couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah. And, and the um, – you know, street after street after street, they had to – you know, just pick up and move massive amounts of home goods. Yeah. It flooded really yeah. bad. It I remember filled, that. It filled two football fields full. Yep. And I used to live in, in Miami and South Florida, and I can remember the hurricane after the hurricanes and stuff would be piled up to the second story window. Yeah. Massive. A lot of that, as you all know, is because of water damage sure. and mold. But a lot of things like a snap leg on a wooden chair or um, a lamp that got bent or doesn't come on anymore, that is fixable. And back to your story about how your generation wasn't, the skills weren't passed down, it reminded me about a woman came into one of Warwick's repair cafes one day carrying a wicker sewing basket, and she said it had belonged to her mother, the handle was broken. She said her mother tried to teach her how to sew on a button and hem up a pair of pants. And she said to her mother, I'm not going to live like you. She said, you're always got something in your hands. She said, your work is never done. She said, I'm going to work in an office and other people are going to work for me. She did. And her mother had recently passed away and she had come back for where she lived in the city to clean out the apartment and found the basket. And she stood there with tears saying, I wouldn't learn when she wanted to teach me, but at least I can have the basket to remember that uh, the connection to her. Interesting. So yeah, part of it's, part of it's male, female, part of it's generational, Yeah. but it means more than just the memory was her mother sitting there. Everybody else is watching TV and her mother's darning socks are sewing on a button for her family to give herself to the family. And there's such a a beautiful circularity to this. Yes. Uh, exactly. Or in one of the phrases we like is, "Learn to repair, repair to learn." Mm. Yeah, I like that. I love that about the, your book too. The the you'll talk a lot about that. The uh, and this is something I hadn't really even heard of. I, I'm going to mess this up. I should have wrote the term down, but it was like a circular circular economy where yes, one thing is producing a waste product, but it's consciously decided that that waste is going to be the raw good for another economy oh, yes. within that cycle. And I loved that. I, you, you can daydream about exactly. that all day. I mean, <laughs> that would be a beautiful world if we could be, take these conscious steps. Well, it's the natural world. And that's, that's, it's built on this idea of, you know, emulating the natural world because that's what does happen in, right. In creation. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I thought was really awesome about that book was that you know the first part of it at least the beginning was these great stories of people Uh bringing objects in and their relationship to them and i loved all of those little stories but then you get into some of the history of kind of where things start to go askew right (laughs) and i loved that because it's super informative it actually has we get to where we are yeah how did we get here i mean i think there's a lot of it's just told us that too who told us to become a consumer not a citizen not being responsible with using the resources who told us that and when how early did that happen that was really surprising to me john had done a lot of research for that yeah that i love that because the book ends up getting into some to me what I didn't expect from the book was to connect it to spirituality so much like I did, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I kept finding that over and over. I mean, I, 
I remember, and I've told this story once on the pod before, but I was at a church event years ago and a lady, uh, it's out of earshot, you know, she drank a water and she was chatting with a friend and she went to go throw her water bottle in the trash and she stopped and I heard her tell her friend, she goes, I wonder if throwing plastic in the trash is like a sin or something. And then she threw it in the trash and she walked off. <laughs> And she wasn't trying to be funny, you know, but like I, it lingered with me, like in my mm-hmm. mind when I left, mm-hmm. I thought it's funny that we haven't really fully within some spiritual traditions, it hasn't fully been embraced that we have a spiritual connection to nature and the world and an, and a, and a a responsibility as stewards, you know, to, Mm -hmm. to take the moment where she did have that, that moment of clarity where she went, Oh, that could have been a life changing moment for her is what I've thought many times. I'm like that, that starts with that bottle right there. She could have went not, not only should I consider recycling, but Hey, maybe I should even understand what is recycling, Mm -hmm. even solving the problem at all. What's really going on with that. And y'all talk about that in the book too. Right. I mean, the mm-hmm. revelations that that's not really going to solve recycling is not going right. to save our save the day. You know, that's not mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. issue. It's the throwing away in the first place or the designing of the product. Yes. On the front end, you know, in a conscious yes. way. Yeah. Well, it's, it's certainly true. Uh, you know, uh, the repair cafe that, that kind of got things started here in the Hudson Valley I was the one that I uh, got going in at the Methodist Church in New Paltz. So yeah. I grew up Methodist, and and I was new to the area, but it was very natural for me to stop in and look around and introduce myself to the pastor, and and uh, and she says, "Well, you know, come on, come on back, and you know, let's talk more about this." So I sat down with her and and one other person in the in the congregation, and we talked it through, and she said. I love this idea. Please do it here. Yeah. <laughs> don't, you know, don't take it somewhere else. We, we really want, we really love to have that here. And, uh, and so there, there are repair cafes in, in, uh, you know, churches, uh, as, as I like to say, we're very ecumenical. So Lutheran, yeah. Reformed, Catholic, Methodist, and, uh, Uh, And they all, you know, embrace it for, you know, they recognize in it the caring for creation aspect of it. Yeah. So it's it's been um, it's been a great thing. It's all being good stewards. And we're not here to just take. We're here to be part of giving it back also Mm -hmm. at an ecological level, at a spiritual level, at a practical level. You just can't keep taking the resources and thinking it's going to be sustainable forever. We already know it's not, even though I just opened up a clothing catalog yesterday and there was a a picture of a pile of blue jeans and said, these have been made with plastic bottles. Okay, that's great, but it still takes resources to make the plastic and to harvest it back. And right. And where does it end up? And and too much of it ends up in the ocean. So we could do without. Yeah. It's it's a difficult thing, though, to I mean, that's mindfulness just in itself. I mean, I Mm -hmm. I think about this all the time. I mean, our society just isn't structured for the type of living we need to be doing. I mean, in in general, there's this almost like there's this invisible hand in play that's moving everything around and we're all plugged into it and just chugging along. And you really have to slow down. To, to make this possible, I, I think. I mean, like, you know, just going grocery shopping alone, I mean, we, we become pretty package conscious. But you go, okay, package consciousness, just that alone, mm. it slows you down and you get to the store and you realize, oh, I can't even buy this thing that I came for if I'm being really package conscious. Mm. You know, like, for instance, I switch to... Uh, and y'all will probably say, hey, that's a good first step. But, like, I switched to a, a using a straight razor, right? Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, okay, I'm just going to – and it's not one of the kind that you sharpen on a leather strope. It's a um, <laughs> it's the kind where you break the blade in half and you put – it clips yes. into the handle. But yes. I, I could use a blade for 
gosh, six months or more. I mean, realistically, because I don't only trim a little bit. So I can go, well, I can trim the lines and do the little neck work. But I, I switched a while back. I, I don't know why I switched to one of the, back to another disposable razor thing. And I, I try to make those blades last as long as I can. And the other day I had to switch it out. And I was reading your book, actually, in the middle of it. <laughs> but I had the blade on that came on the handle, right? And, you know, it's a, it's a fairly nice razor, I think. And so I was like, oh, I got to get a new blade. I know I have a pack somewhere. And I opened the drawer and I pull the package out. And so to get this package open, I mean, this thing is no bigger than a pack of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. I had to tear off a plastic tab, rip through a plastic thing that was sealing it shut. I open it up, and there's a black plastic container inside the box. There was a plastic lid on top of the black plastic container, which when I got that open, there was another plastic container with a little lid, and when I finally got it open, the razors was in there. And when I sat and really, I, I within moments, I'm meditating on... Mm -hmm. all of this is junk now i mean so much extra and i didn't mm -hmm. need all of this all i need is the little blade which also is going to get in the, thrown in the waste and i yeah. just thought you know if you do that with every package on the shelf i mean man what a colossal problem we have i mean that's just one guy thinking about yeah. one package for one tiny thing yeah, it does multiply. Yeah. yeah, packaging is a big part of this, and and uh, you know, uh, progress is being made, but it's very slow. Yeah. Well, I could go but on all day about that for sure. <laughs> but this is the part where we, as individuals, can make a resolution to at least repair the things that we own, so we reduce right. our dependency on having to buy a new one. And one of the great things about the repair cafe is even if you don't know how to repair it, there's somebody there sitting across the table who can show you how to repair it. Yeah, I've seen times when the person came from the um, customer, the person seeking the repair, and I turn around and, and come back to walk around the room, and she's sitting next to the person with the sewing machine, and the other woman is saying to her, okay, now this is how you put in the piece of elastic. Ah. We actually had a woman bring in a sewing machine one day and said, I don't know how to thread this thing. There's oh. something wrong. And they sat and showed her how to thread it. Somebody else brought one in and said he had been fixing it for his mother and it stopped working. And what part did he need? And it turns out he just needed to be oiled, but he didn't know how to do that. Yeah. what I, That was in the book, wasn't it? He, the pedal wasn't working or something, yeah. right? Yeah. How, yeah. I mean, how, how, um, I'm sure that's a joy to see people do that at the repair cafes over and over again, yeah. that, that revelation that they can do it one or that exactly. it was something so, so simple. You, you see it happening right in front of you and you turn around and, um, did you get to the part about the kids take it apart table? Yeah. I thought that was really cool. I really did. That was cool. And it's simply a place where as, um, Someone brought in a uh, hairdryer, and she said every time she plugged it in, it uh, made a horrible smell, and smoke came out. And she took it over to the small electrics team, and they said, yeah, this is dead and done. She said, okay, well, where's the recycling basket? And the guy said, take it over to the kids' take it apart table. And so she was calling it the reuse play station. <laughs> and we had a whole bunch of little tiny, yep, we had a whole bunch of little tiny screwdrivers. And Jim Harper uh, was sitting there and showing the kids that, okay, this is how you hold the screwdriver. This is how you take it apart. This is, he would cut the plug off first so nobody got fried. Yeah. And he would explain not just what the manual skill, but what this was connected to that. So the kids are sitting there having a great time. One woman said her four-year-old, she came down the stairs one morning and discovered he had taken apart the vacuum cleaner by himself. Interesting. And she said, we haven't got enough things for him to work on. So she brought him just to get a relief from, from his taking things apart she said he has nobody else to play with at home to do this so she said he sat at the table she said he can't even sit still at home she says he hasn't moved in 45 minutes <laughs> because he was with a bunch of other yeah, kids so true just, the kids just, just hunker down with it. yeah i mean you've seen that at your repair cafe john i'm sure yes. yeah and and Oren, uh this is the common common story that is told by so many of our you know we call them repair coaches right yeah uh, and and that is that when they were little, they took things apart. Interesting. And they couldn't at first, you know, they didn't know how to put them back together. But 
they wanted to be able to. And so that started them on their learning curve. And now, you know, they grew up to be people who know a lot about a lot of things. And that's one of the things that they all say they love about being a repair coach is because they're sitting there with other geeks who were just like them, and they love to do the problem solving together. You'll see see them lean over each other's table with their mouths open about, how did you do that? Or, I don't know what the next problem is. Is this the wrong size screw? That's the thing. I'm getting emails now, and you must be too, John from the coaches who say, when can we come back together? We really miss being together. We really miss talking about this stuff. Yeah, they miss each other. Uh, and it is true that many of our repairs are collaborative. You mm-hmm. know, so it's, you know, I'm, I'm sitting, I'm woodworking is my skill set. Right? Okay. So when I, when I go to Elizabeth's repair cafe, she's the organizer there, but I show up just to fix stuff. And so I'm at the table and I'm, you know, somebody brings me something and it's like, okay, hmm. You know, and then I'll say, Frank, take a look at this. Or Naomi, take a look at this. Ah. And and then we put our heads together. And it's it's a great bonding experience for sure. And, And the mutual respect, you know. I mean, Naomi's a professional. She knows more than I do, that's for sure. Yeah. And the coaches enjoy it so much that, and I'm sure you see this at your repair cafe too, John, the coaches eventually will bring a friend along or an office colleague or they'll bring a spouse, and those people end up staying to become a coach too. I think this is fun. so interesting. I mean, it makes me, my mind's going all over the place. I'm thinking about the value and I thought this when I was reading your book, but just listening to y'all and looking at your faces, too. I wish the audience could see y'all are both smiling <laughs> because of the feeling, right? I mean, there's something special yeah. about passing a, one collaboration with other people and then also expanding your own knowledge base and then the joy of watching those light bulbs go off when other people are watching you and they're going, oh, ding, 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 ding. I understand now. Mm-hmm. You know, I can do this. I could go do this. And one of the things that was really important for me, I had somebody who was a um, an elderly gentleman who had palsied hands, and somebody pulled me aside and said, do you really think he's going to be able to work on this? It turns out his disability was the advantage. He would get the person who brought the small electric. Some days his hands wouldn't work well enough to use the screwdriver, but he would say, okay, I'm going to hold this for you, but you need to do this. No, put it at this angle. No, give it another little twist to that. So the person was interactive with him. He was doing what the whole point is, is to teach somebody else how to be engaged and think you can learn this too. Yeah. Step by step. He was wonderful. And, he was a and, high school teacher. You know, so so often, you know, when someone is um, on their way out, carrying their item on their way out, and uh, and I'll say, well, how how did it go today? You know, what what happened today? And you would expect them to say, oh, I got it fixed, or oh my gosh, it was free. But in fact, I will tell you, the the words they use most often, hands down, are it was fun. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like fun. There was something in your book. And it was something, there were a couple of things that I'd never thought of before. And it, one was just the word repair. I've never mm. sat and meditated on it, but that, I, I don't know why that part of your book just drew me in. Cause I started thinking about the real high philosophy, like, a, you know, that almost like a, uh, a whole cosmology around the word repair, mm. like what it oh, really so. means. I mean, a, a con- a constellation of meanings. Yeah, it was just fascinating. It was like, oh, so it implies that oneness is the, to me, and I'm going to get really, this is trippy for me, the way I thought of it. It was like, oneness is sort of the original state. The original state is community and wholeness. And there's been this sort of division and dividing and pulling apart. But we're healing that. We're going to heal that and bring things all back together in this nice harmony. You know, it's like a machine that's got a part in it that's just out of whack. You know, it's not right. It just needs that thing. And it's going to start moving again the way it should and be more efficient. You know, mm-hmm. now, had you been familiar with the term tikkun olam, which no. is he- Hebrew for repair of the world? And and part of the idea there is that, you know, in in God's eyes, something that has been repaired is more holy than something that is new. Ah, it's it's our brokenness. It's and like it's, kintsugi, you know, kind of like the uh, the gold 
Exactly. Mm-hmm. In, in Japan, um, when I was I was there on a tea business, and they were showing me how the how much they prized the cup that had been cracked and repaired. And when you there's a particular way that you hold the teacup, the handleless teacup in Japan, you respect the object by always turning it away from your face before you drink from it to show respect to the person who made it and the object itself. And they revere the one that they've been able to, to make whole again. I love that. This whole, this whole um, thread of hospitality is so strong. And, and, well, and that's why they call it a, a cafe. It's the idea is that people will sit down and share a beverage and sit down and share a snack. And it's um, like the old expression, he drew a line to shut me out. I drew a circle and drew him in. Oh, yeah. The, I, I was once in the home furnishings business, and I had, had to attend an industry conference. And this man said, do you know why round tables are the best-selling shape? And, of course, none of us did. And he said, it's because we used to sit around a fire in a cave and listen to stories in a circle. So, mm. so everybody had access to the fire. He said, that's why everybody relates to that, having a meal together so when martina postma started the repair cafe she wanted to invite people in to be able to share that aspect of it too and it's i used to be in the tea business and one of the things that they would the way that tea has been described is it's um it's a social lubricant it encourages it's a warm beverage Mm. and, and China during the years when during the Cultural Revolution when they couldn't get tea, you served hot water so that you still maintain the connection and the ceremony to offering something nourishing and warm to somebody else. And, and that's what the cafe does. People, I've had coaches call me over and say, "You've got to listen to this story. You've got to hear the story behind the lamp that looked like an oh, orange flamingo yeah. dancer." That was I loved that. That was one of my favorite things. I've I've. I would say people people who know me well probably would say I have too many objects, but I have a hard time just letting things go because I don't have these objects that are important to me just to have them. They all have – I could tell you the story. I touch it and hold exactly. it, and I could talk exactly. to you about what it means yes. and where it came from, and that's important to me. They're, it's, they're, they're like books. you know, like They're the story mm-hmm. and energy. And that's, and that's exactly. where – Every repair begins, Oren, is, you know, you bring your item, you sit down across the table with a person who is going to give it their attention and give you their attention. And the repair begins when you tell the story of the thing you've brought. Oh, that's that. That's fascinating to me. There used to be this little, uh, I don't know, I guess you call it like an antique shop, but it was a, a shop that had many different little antique shops under one roof, you know, mm-hmm. a consignment mm-hmm. store, maybe something like yes. that. And it was one of my favorite places to go here in town. And I always had the strangest experiences with that place. I would, it was near where my studio was and I would be driving by and sometimes just a thought would occur to me about an object. I mean, like a strange thing, like a fire poker. This is one of my favorite things was uh, this fire poker story. I was driving by there, and I every time I would drive by there, I would get like this thought. Like, man, I was just sitting around a fire and having a nice place to store the wood and just poking at one of these old iron fire pokers. You know, like a really – I was like my feeling. And so one day that I just couldn't quit thinking about it, and I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to stop in there and see if they have something like that. And so I walk in, and – I walk right down the into one of the little rooms and sitting on the floor in the little room was this iron ring and it had logs sitting on it and it had an old iron fire poker leaned against it. They were both very <laughs> rusty and I was like, is this for sale? And the lady said, yeah, someone brought that in like four or five days ago. And I said, oh, okay. I said, well, I want it. And she's like, I told them somebody was going to buy that. <laughs> and and I, I drove down to the studio and I brought it in and my wife was there and she was like, what in the world? I said, you've been, she said, you've been talking about a fire poker for like a week now. I said, I know. I said, but every day I drive by that place, I can't get it out of my head. And when I got it, it felt like, I know this seems so strange, but it just felt like someone 
it didn't like it wasn't mine it was like it was gifted to me like somebody wanted me to have it it belonged to someone else and they were like you're gonna love this and i loved it so i want you to have it so you can love it too and i keep it i mean it's my favorite i mean when every time we have a fire and friends gather i use that poker to stir the wood and i feel like whoever it belonged to yeah, is sort of present almost mm-hmm. in that ring of fire, you know, with friends and laughter. <laughs> I know that seems probably strange, but I mean, I think objects have that yeah, power. Great. They have that love in them almost. Some objects, yeah, you know, that's great. Yeah, yeah, they come with a story. Oh yeah. yeah, I would love to know who it belonged to. I'm sure there was a story there. It could have been passed down, you know, and it was just lost in a shed somewhere. I don't know. I've always imagined those things with these objects. That's what I loved about your book the most, I think, were those stories, really. Those mm-hmm. little things that people would share with you. Uh, well, Elizabeth, tell Oren how you collected those stories and, and what the in, impulse was behind them. Okay. Um, Oren, I once worked um, as an account manager for a marketing communications firm. So I was the one, as you well know, would have to go out and talk to the client, try to get them to be specific about what they needed, what's the timetable, what's the budget, and then go back and decant that for the art department and get them still excited about it. And long story short, um, after every time we would we would get a project or every client meeting, I would write up a report so everybody knew what was what was going on, what was expected, who was going to do it, what was the deadline, blah, blah, blah. So We've got 30 volunteers, and I was so appreciative of the fact that they showed up and brought their friends and brought their spouses and helped spread the word. And yeah. they, they, they at, arrived at, at your the, repair cafes from the very beginning. From the very beginning. Ah, okay. So I wrote a report because I wanted them to know how much I appreciated and respected what they did. And the report would have how many people showed up that day on, on average 75 to 80 where did they come from on average 13 to 19 different towns the coaches come from nine different towns and then i would make a list of what stuff people brought in because i would read the job tickets ah okay and then the way that people described it things like horse with broken butt what on earth does that mean <laughs> What do, you, what do you expect us to do with a horse? Well, it turned out it was a little metal sculpture and then had to be um, glued back together. So I would write up the stories, uh, what was wrong with the lamp, two kittens chewed wire, not one, two, <laughs> and tell the success rate if I knew it and if we needed another part. And then there would be the stories. I would either overhear them or people would stop somebody came up to me one day and said, Elizabeth, you need to stand outside the door when people are leaving. And I said, why? We don't have enough help getting it to the car. And she said, no, you need to hear what they say to each other. Ah. So that, and then I would write up these kind of three or four page reports and I would email them out to all of the coaches. And then the coaches themselves would respond and say, yeah, but you didn't see what happened with the with the baseball gloves. So <laughs> my wife had to take it home and and we got the kids involved in rethreading it or um, you didn't see the part, the part where some of it I overheard the part where the guy who had had his own bicycle repair store in Manhattan for 49 years was helping somebody repair a cheese grater. The problem was described as suction sucks. <laughs> it had a rubber thing they had to clamp it on the table. Yeah. And Roger being Roger said at the end when he got it done, make America great again. And we were <laughs> great laughing. And the guy with the thing was not as amused. But anyway, I'm writing these stories up, sending them to the coaches. The coaches are telling me the stories I don't know, correcting something that, no, there were 39 knives, not 52. And then I would send them to the people who were sponsoring our repair cafe, to the village mayor to the chamber of commerce blah 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 and but i was sending them to john too because i'd never run a repair cafe before i just started one but he was the coordinator for 30 or 40 of them so i would run them by him sort of like as a reality check is this the way this is supposed to happen (laughs) i didn't know I'd only been to one before with a lamp and came out of it and thought, why don't we have one? Mm-hmm. Well, so Oren, 
Elizabeth is sending me these wonderful stories, you know, story after story. And I'm just, you know, I immediately recognize first what a great storyteller she is and what a good writer she is. And at that point in time, I had I already had um, uh, a literary agent who had found me. I'm, I'll just say, you know, the, uh, I was not out looking, but she approached me. Uh, and uh, so we were, you know, I was well into writing the proposal and, you know, we were we were into it. Yeah. And I just uh, I had this revelation that, oh, my gosh, Elizabeth is writing exactly the kind of stories this book needs. Yeah. And I know I can't do it as well. And she captures, you know, the spirit and the personality, uh, the creativity, the generosity uh, that goes on in that in in that room. Yeah. And I just I just knew that has to be in the book. So yeah. I said, Elizabeth, how about how about you write this book with me? Would you? <laughs> nice. I was going to ask you that how you guys got hooked up together because it's a fascinating work. It, it, so many things about it. I mean, you know, I'll tell, I'll share a little something with you guys. You know, during the, after the hurricanes, the dual hurricanes this year, yeah, my family and I were separated for a while, and so my wife um, and children actually just moved home just last weekend. Oh my so gosh. We were, they were in North Louisiana, about two and a half mm-hmm. hours from here, and it's a town that I I lived in for many years uh, while things or repairs were being done here. Oh. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was time for them to come home and schools are finally starting to kind of get some semblance of, uh, I guess, a system in place. So they came home to kind of get prepared for that. While they were gone, though, um, my wife had our copper tea kettle up there in North Louisiana with her. And so during my time down here, I'd been using I have a little uh, aluminum percolator that I was using to boil my water in, you know, in the mornings for my coffee. Yeah. But normally when we were all together, we would boil that copper tea kettle every morning. It was on the stove and that was like something whoever was up first put the hot water on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the other more I get up very early before everybody in my home and the other morning I got up and I, I, I just stood in the kitchen and I looked at that copper tea kettle and I thought, you know, I hope you were, I, I almost was talking to it. I was like, I hope you're, I hope you remain in our life, you know, because mm. you're a sign that we're repaired to some degree. You know, I didn't okay. realize that that copper mm. tea kettle sitting on the stove had gravity to it. You know, it was, yeah. it's a signal that we're together. Yeah. You know, it's almost like a we, um, a family bond, that thing. Yeah. It's like it's- we're home. Because there's that dual meaning. I mean, repair does mean to restore something to its, you know, working condition. But there's that other root word, which means to to go home. Mm, yeah, to, yeah. You know, to 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 be able to go to a place of safety and refuge. That is also, you know, that's the second meaning of repair. Yeah. Yeah, your book got me thinking about good design, too. I wonder, I actually wanted to ask both of you this. You know, in doing these repair cafes, I'm sure you uh, encounter just, you know, all kinds of things, maybe things you've never even seen before sometimes. Oh, yeah. (laughs) But are there things that you go, you know what, this, I've encountered them enough that this is a good design. This is something that stands the test of time. Uh, even though it may need to be repaired, the repairs are always almost minimal, and it, you see them because they have longevity to them. They, they'll be here. You well, know. it's interesting that you should say that. Um, not long ago, my example of that will be lamps. Mm, really? Now we see more lamps than anything else, and that is true in repair cafes and fix-it clinics all across the country. But rewiring a lamp has changed almost not at all Hmm. in the last three generations. You know, I, I dare say that any repair manual published within the last hundred years has, you know, a section on how to rewire a lamp and it hasn't changed at all. And so 
lamp parts are the one category of parts that we actually have an inventory of at our repair cafe. So we have sockets, you know, two or three different kinds, and um, switches, lamp, lamp wire, and switches and plugs, right? Yeah, you know, you know the basics. But the, those are such standard parts, and that's all you need. Now, there was, I will say, in the 60s and 70s, there was kind of a thing with halogen lamps and so forth. So occasionally we'll find those, and that's that's a little bit of a different category. But, oh, my gosh, 98% of the lamps we see can all be rewired and repaired and got, you know, beautifully lighting up with with just these standard and very inexpensive parts. And that also... Um brings up something that reminds me when I was trying to get the repair cafe started and get enough coaches and I didn't have enough. Long story short, we did a photo op that was arranged by the Chamber of Commerce and it had one woman who had volunteered to fix lamps was holding a lamp at the suggestion of the mayor and somebody else was holding a wooden toy and somebody else was holding a uh, laptop. And one of the members of the Chamber of Commerce, a woman came up to me and said, you know, this sounds like a good idea, but aren't you concerned you're going to be putting uh, local businesses out of business? And I said, well, where would you get a lamp repaired around here? And it turns out most of the lamps that come in are, as the woman who does our jewelry repairs, these aren't things. These are meaningful things. Ah. At our very first repair cafe, a little girl came in with a lamp that was part of a pair that had sat on her grand grandmother's nightstands, and it didn't work. And the F- Fix It Bob showed the mom. Did you get and that, Orin? Fix, fix It, it Bob. Bob. Fix It Bob. Fix It Bob. I like was, that. <laughs> Bob's father was an electrician, so Fix It Bob had gone around with him learning how to do that since he was a boy didn't want to go to college. His dad insisted he did. And when Fix It Bob graduated, he became a Navy CB. And his job was to repair nuclear reactors in remote sites. And as Bob says, you don't call the hardware store for the missing part. (laughs) So Fix It Bob was able to teach the mom and the little girl how to fix the the switch because there was a mate to the lamp at home. And you know that that's not just a lamp. Yes, you could go to a big box store and buy another one, but you can't buy grandma's lamp, right. which is not just a lamp. It's a meaningful object like your tea kettle. It, it signals something bigger. Yeah. I and, have, I think, I, I, I agree with this. I love this. I mean, this is, to me, there are things that, for me, it's cast iron. I mean, I have a huge cast iron collection. And I, don't, I mean, it's not a collection. I use it all. But in the more I use it, the better it gets. And I love finding old cast iron because people throw it out yeah, and it's I've so easy to reseason and it's a joy, yeah. you know, and I, I remember Anthony Bourdain had, he used to do this show, um, an internet show where he would go interview old crack people who did crafts and, and, you know, things that are oh. sort of lost arts and skills. It was a little internet series. It's really great. Huh. I can't I remember what it's that. called, but I'll find it and send you the link. It's that wonderful. Okay? It was. Uh-huh. A, it, I think it was a. Um, there was a whiskey. It it's it's a, well. There was a whiskey and a, a family who's produced like a whiskey in Scotland for like a hundred years, and they had okay. used this as a series to promote the the authentic quality. You know, the old way that they still do mm-hmm. things. So they sent Anthony around. You know, he's such. He was such a. Had such a passion for things like that and culture. And anyway, there was a cast iron episode, and he talked about something I'd never heard before, which I loved, and it stuck with me. And it was the wake of a thing, and it was the breath of the of the walk. And so, when you're cooking in like a, a walk, and I, I kind of apply that to my cast iron. It's like mm-hmm. every meal that I've ever cooked in these some of these skillets for my family, for my loved ones, for my friends. There's always a you know an, a bonding of oil to this metal, mm. and as long as I take care of it, when I'm gone, the breath of every meal and the spirit of every person that ever ate that meal is sort of captured in that that object in the, within the bowl of the iron, the whatever oh, yeah. it may be. And I just love that. I mean, it's so tied to what you guys are helping people do. And this is, yeah, it's an important concept that the material things in our lives, uh, they embody 
the materials that were used to make them, but also the energy that went into it, the human skill that went into it. All of those things are embodied within every object. And we just, you know, when it's an object that is crafted, you know, and, and designed with, with care and thoughtfulness, that is, uh, you know, you know the difference. You know the difference. Oh, sure. You see it. Yeah. And things that, you know, kind of what, what goes around comes around, the whole notion of it used to be shameful to see something with a patch on. It meant that you couldn't afford to buy a new one. People would make fun of kids who went to school with uh, patched clothing. Oh, yeah. Well, now that's a badge of honor and a badge of creativity. We have, um, I learned that you don't call uh, women who do sewing repairs or make their own clothes, you don't call them a seamstress anymore. You call them a sewist. Really? I did not know that. It's a combination of sew and artist. And one of the techniques now is called visible mending. And you're meant to see the way that it's patched because that's an opportunity for you to make a creative decision. It's not meant to be invisible. Yeah. And you'll see, um, I mean, the best thing, when I was a little girl, my mother had made me a a brown corduroy jumper, and I wore it to school, and I uh, tore it on the jungle gym the first day. I was real popular when I got home. And she made a, um, my mother made a patch that looked like a lily pad, and it had a little green felt frog with beaded eyes embroidered on top of the patch. And not only that, the patch was made into a pocket. I mean, that was more than 50 years ago, and I can still see that. The patch Uh. was better than the jumper. And that's part of a story that I want to tell you, too. It's the visible mending doesn't apply just to objects at a repair cafe. Sometimes you see it happen right in front of you to a person. Oh, wow. And John had asked me to tell you this story. Yes, please. The short version of it is there was a kid who needed community service hours for his um, school. 13 years old, the mom says he's been, he wants to come to a repair cafe. And I said, fine. She said, well, but he's not coming just to open the door. He knows how to fix things. And I said, well, like what? She said, well, he's been fixing small engines since he was about six years old with his dad. So he does know what he's doing. I said, okay, but we're still going to have to pair him with an adult for his own safety. Fine. So I'm in the parking lot unloading my car as all the other coaches are doing with their supplies. I've got the cafes set up, and this truck pulls into the parking lot, roars in is more like it, and hmm. the windows are down, and the dad turns the engine off, and then he starts yelling at this kid, I'm coming back here to pick you up at noon, and I better not hear this, and I'd better not hear that, and you better not be a little blankety blank, and I hope you know what you're doing, and don't mess this up, and that's not the word he used, and it was were so loud every one of us unloading our stuff could hear it and the kids just looking at his feet so the kid gets out shuts the door the father roars down the hill and one of the women who was a high school teacher is taking the sewing machine out of her car who was parked right next to the truck and she turns to the boy and says well the best of the rest of the day is going to be a lot better than this huh, wow he opens the door for her I introduce him to Fix-It Bob, who's working on lamps, and I introduce him to Rich White, who's working on the bicycles and other things with wheels. So the kid's working with Bob, and it it turns out he already knows how to wire a lamp. So what really gets him excited is an elderly woman comes in pushing a lawnmower, and she's followed by a young man who's maybe like 19 or 20. The boy gets up, we'll call him Roger, that's not his name, gets up from behind the table, rushes over, takes the lawnmower away from her, picks it up, heaves it onto the six by three foot table. Now Rich comes over because it's a wheeled object and the kid's asking the woman a couple of questions and poking at it. And Rich said to me later, he said, that kid is a mechanical genius. He said he diagnosed the problem correctly in 30 seconds. The woman is so thrilled she grabs him by the face and kisses him on both cheeks and says, yeah, <laughs> like, like this. And says, my grandson needs that to earn money. So when the dad is, we know what time the dad's coming to pick the kid up. And 
I asked the two guys, well, how did it go working with Roger today? He's great. When can he come back? And I said, well, that's going to depend on his dad. When his dad comes, I'd like you to tell him specifically, each of you, one different thing that you particularly enjoyed about working with them. So the dad arrives, the kid's there. They're telling the dad how pleased they was. They, the story I just told you about, he diagnosed it in 30 seconds. And you can see this kid stand up straight. His face opens up. He's beaming. He's looking up at his dad. And his dad's looking at him. And he's no longer talking to the kid the way that we heard it in the parking lot. To me, wow. that's visible mending. Yeah. And Roger brought a chum with him, the next repair cafe, and the two boys, again, worked under an, an adult's uh, observation, but they had, they diagnosed another problem with a lawnmower that it had the wrong kind of gas in it, and they were right. That That's the real value, right? I mean, that's how we save, yes. that's how we save each other, and we save, I guess... You know, on one hand, I sometimes think about this. This planet doesn't need us necessarily. But I I heard someone say this many months ago, and it stuck with me. And it was that, you know, energy is moving through the universe, and it's rising up in all kinds of forms, making all kinds of things happen. And on this planet, energy has moved through the universe and rose up as human beings. And what are we going to do? with that you know when we realize that it has moved and arisen in us as these conscious creatures you know that the earth doesn't need us but we can really be a part of it and be and help heal each other and 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 move that good energy through each other and repair sort of all our divisions i mean it's interesting that through what you're doing you're actually doing something else too. I just think that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I want to like let that soak. I'm probably it's probably going to stick with me. You know, we well, never when I, know. When I when I wanted advice when I was first starting this repair cafe, I called John and he said, "You know, you think you're keeping stuff out of the landfill, and that's fine, and you will." He said, "But what you don't yet know is you're building community." And I thought, "What does that mean?" Mm. But when I was there the first time, and you see something like the story I just told you about the boy and his dad, that's building community. That's repairing relationships. Yeah. And you see at every repair cafe, something like that happens where you could put your head down on the table and sob, mm-hmm. or you're laughing. So hard you're snorting your milk. It's, <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah, well, and there's and, the, the quote that we have at the beginning of chapter uh, chapter six, which is "Repairing is caring," and the quote is, "In taking up repair, we prompt a conversation and inquiry into the ethics and practice of care of things, yeah, but also of each other." our environment, and our communities. That's it right there. Gosh. And it just does. It captures that whole idea of what you're doing. I mean, I learned so much. I I do. I hope people will read the book, first of all, but I hope they'll actually really meditate on what your, your, your real message is in there. You know, because it is fun and, and, and hobby and having something to do and repairing things and Yes, that is good, but I, I there's just such a bigger thing going on in there. You can feel it when I could feel it when I was reading it. I could just feel like certain things soaking, uh, soaking in. You know, there's a bigger picture there, and oh. it made me want to be more mindful. It makes me. It made me think about the things in my life that I have. Uh, in fact, last night I was thinking about your, your book because we have a we have a new washing machine, and uh, we we had inst- I installed it. Excuse me, this yes, is this, yes. this young boy who was never taught how to do anything <laughs> plumbing or anything. I installed it and it didn't work, <laughs> so I had obviously done something wrong, and I felt this old dread after I installed it and it didn't work. Like it was this old feeling of. Um, You're not good enough. You didn't do it right. You stink. Don't do this again. You should have hired a plumber. Well, ultimately, I did have to call a plumber because I really couldn't get it to work. But when the plumber came over, I I always think about this guy. He came over and he took the dishwasher out and I explained it to him. I said, look, I 
there were something our old connections our house is old the connections didn't match so i cannibalized some parts i explained i cannibalized some stuff off the other one that was broke Mm -hmm. to try to make it fit and step it down you know and he and i'll never forget like what he said he pulled it all out and he goes and this is i thought man if i wish more people were like this guy he goes hey he said come see because, I mean, I was paying him to do the job. He could have never talked to me again and just fixed it. And it made me think of you guys because of what he did next. He said, come see. And he put a flashlight on it, and he goes, you did everything right. He said, you were almost there. He said, but uh-huh. look here. And then he showed me, like, what I was, what I had missed. And yeah. he said, but all I need, he said, you, you wouldn't have been able to fix it because we actually need a part that we don't have. He said, but I'm going to run down to the hardware store and get the part and come back. I'll show you. And... Just that little thing he said when he said, you were almost there, but you just didn't do this. And we don't really have it. He said, maybe you could have figured it out pretty much is what he was telling me. Maybe you could have got it right because you were just missing a part. So he gets a part and he comes back about 30 minutes later and he said, well, come see. And and I kind of stood over his shoulder and watched him do it. And he was showing me what he did. He said, yeah, man. He just kept saying that over again. He said, you were almost there. You were almost there. I know this seems so silly, but it was like it lifted gravity like off my shoulders, like all these years of, um, you don't yeah. know what you're doing. Just de- melted away. I was like, Oh, I was actually felt good. I was like, Oh, I was on the right track. Okay. I can do this. And I wondered about, you know, these cafes and I thought how many people get that feeling, you know, by helping fix their own, you know, yeah. objects. Hey, exactly. Aaron, Aaron, if we'd heard that story before we, before we wrote the book, it would be in the book. Exactly. I just wrote down that. Come, yeah, those words that you just you know said. Come see, come see. Those are really you know those are emblematic of of something really important. Come see. Yeah. It's an invitation. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's out of respect. I know you want to know, so come see. Right. Yeah. And I'll, yeah. That's and that's wonderful. what you know. Isn't that what every you know parent? Every good parent does with mm. their children. Come see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have. I've had that. I think that's. Uh, I love it when I meet someone who's curious. You know, mm-hmm. I, I really do because it's they're going. Hey, I. It's almost like, and I've thought this a few times. Like we live in a culture sometimes where when you ask why, it's almost seen as a um, a, a negative challenge. Like it's yep. like it's perceived as pushback. And I would love mm-hmm. it if we could get back to a point where that why wasn't seen that way, you know, where the why was like, no, I genuinely like even if it's why do you believe that or if it's mm-hmm. why do you practice that or why does your family um, say these prayers or why does your culture? I would love it if that why became a p- more positive again to where it was like. Just cult, just just across the world. If we could just say that and go yeah. why, and then someone go, oh, I'll tell you why, and it's like a non-judgmental why. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it opens the door for dialogue and for us to go, oh, okay, now I. And once you understand, you get. Y'all brought that up. Y'all were talking about that in the book, and I was so it was refreshing. You were talking about um, Hindus pulling over when a cow lays down on the road. Yep. And I was like, oh, this is so refreshing. I did not expect this to be in this book. I really did not expect this at all. And I was like, this is, this is great. This is crossover territory that I love. And uh, I was like, yeah, you were like, okay. And you explained why, because there are people who will just go, oh, that's ridiculous. And from certain culture, they'll go, oh, that's ridiculous and blow that off and make jokes about it. But you took it very seriously. You put it in the book, yes. and you were like, "This is why. This is the why of it." It's such well, a beautiful it is true. thing. I, you know, I think uh, we, you know, we're very happy with what we've what we've got here. And one of the th- things that we really enjoy is the that uh, there are parts of the book that will be such a surprise to so many people. They would not expect. I mean, one example of that is this unexpected affinity between the act of repairing and people with autism. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and what, a, what a match that is and what a beneficial, you know, sort of interpersonal dynamic it offers 
to adults with autism. It's really, it's, and this is something both Elizabeth and I have, have seen in our repair cafes. Uh, and it's just terrific. Yeah. And one of the things that isn't always just to be able to focus to repair something, one of our repair coaches uh, repaired uh, stringed instruments. And he was um, a music teacher. He, uh, he taught people how to play the guitar. He brought one of his students, a young man about 20 years old, who was on the autism spectrum. And the two of them performed a concert during a repair cafe on a repaired instrument. Oh, wow. And, yeah. And, and this guy, I hadn't, I didn't put the story, I don't think, exactly in the book, but I had inherited my uh, paternal grandfather's violin, and evidently he used to, to play at dances. And nobody in the family could play this instrument anymore. And I took it to the repair cafe to see if it could be of use. And um, the man who repairs the stringed instruments was Scott, was working on it. And some woman is watching, a customer waiting to get her lamp fixed is watching. And she said, uh, oh, she said, where do you get an, um, a violin like that? Scott said, well, this would be, it's not in good enough shape anymore it's too old but it'd be a good one for a student and the woman said oh there's a family at my church and they uh the little girl wants to play the violin but the family doesn't have enough money to do that so i gave her the violin because i didn't need it and i didn't know where to pass it on but it all happened right there wow that's that's incredible that that right there is magic i mean i love it that's beautiful that yep. really is. That may, so, I mean, it gets the inner there. Yeah. That's that energy moving through the universe. It's, it's, it, mm -hmm. it moves that object to this other place where the sound can vibrate out of it, you know, a new and a whole new life. I, I just think that's a, that's a glorious thing. It really is. I love relics. I love the idea of relics in that, that sense that there's a, I don't know. It's just that there's something I have things like that. I mean, that I can just hold and it's like, it's a meditation just to hold the thing. Well, like you know? your poker. Yeah. It's, right. It's, yeah. Right. It's, there's something about that. And I don't know, you know, I used to think it was cause I read too many comic books when I was a kid. I mean, I always said, I, I love the old <laughs> Thor comic books cause he had, he was this little guy you know, who had a limp and a cane. And when he tapped the cane on the ground, this old little stick that nobody cared about, he would turn into Thor and it was like his hammer and enchanted. And I always thought that was fascinating that an ordinary object could carry, you know, mm -hmm. this great meaning to it. And, tra know? and transformation. Yeah. And transformation. Yeah. thought that was a beautiful thing, you know, that, uh, yeah, this is really, <laughs> this is really great to talk about. Lauren. Uh, this is very nice. Now, this has been fun. I mean, I, I could talk about this kind of thing all day. Hey there, Good News listener. I hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as I've enjoyed producing it. Now, it's time for the Fishing for Goodies segment, where I turn my interviewer role over to the Good News Fish Bowl. Longtime listeners know that the Fish Bowl contains over 400 unique questions, many seated by you, the listeners. Did you know that you could submit unique questions to the Fish Bowl? That's right. Just call the Good News Hotline at 802-459-1668 to have your question added. You can also visit findthegood.news and send me an email. Now, let's take that dive into the fishbowl. I do have a part of the show that y'all might find fun, though. Uh I don't know. Y'all said y'all listen to the podcast. Yeah, we know, so you, know about it. So you know we about know this coming. right here, huh? You know what's coming. All right. This is, this is really the big mystery. So you know there's a bunch of questions in here. Who, where did the questions come from, Orange? Well, okay. You want to talk about, like, well, that's an interesting mishmash. This thing is a mutt. So there are a ton of questions. I wrote 50 questions. <laughs> when I started this podcast, I had this... Um, I really had all this intent. Like I thought, okay, I'm, I have questions that are important to me that I tend to ask people when I'm trying to get to know them to find meaning, you know, and connection. And I saw, so I, I, but I'd never really sat down and analyzed it before. So I wrote them all down and I had this thought that I'll ask each guest these questions without them really knowing it. Right. This was going to be like the framework of my show. What I realized was 50 questions 
if you if you talk for 10 minutes about one question and where that goes, what I found out really quickly was we'd never finish. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't I felt like it was taking me out of the conversation to look at my questions, you know, because I mean, it wasn't something I could memorize. So I threw it away really quickly. This whole idea is like I'd really that takes me out of this intimate relationship I have with people. So what I thought I would do is I'll cut these questions up off of the paper. And so that's what I did. I just took the 50 questions. I cut them up and I threw them in the fishbowl. And I thought I'll just ask them. I'll draw three of these 50 questions. Well, then people started saying things like, hey, can I put something in there? And so my mm. my guests would actually email me questions that they thought were interesting and high value. And it just kept blossoming. And so then I would get like um, board games, you know, and they would have like trivia questions or things that I thought were interesting. And so I would put those in here. And so over time, it's just sort of become like you can kind of see in there. It's like it's got wow. playing cards and it's even got some fortune cookie slips in here, like things oh, that sure. I was like, oh, that was an interesting fortune cookie, you know. So <laughs> Gotta have that. Yeah. So this is sort of a. a I guess cannibalized mishmash soup gumbo, whatever we want to call it. I like gumbo. There you go. Me too. I can start one of those. Oh yeah, it's a lot of fun. Me and my fam my family and I will we'll sit around and light a fire and we'll pass this fishbowl around and have these great conversations mm -hmm. just on this. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is so perfect for you guys. What do you think gets better with age? Uh -huh. Mm. considering mm. that you see so many objects that have uh, probably stood the test of time or maybe so is struggling. Never, not cheese. No, not <laughs> cheese. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, on a puer tea, when I was in a, visiting a tea plantation in Taiwan, the man who was making the tea said, buy this one for your granddaughter's wedding. And you put it aside. The older it gets, the better it gets. It can be 20, 30 years old. And really? It's wonderful. Yeah. And that's Where, true. It actually gets better. Actually, yes. Interesting. Because what, in the West, we still don't know how they make it, but it has something to do with allowing it to age in a particular way. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good one. And my answer to that question, Oren, would be wood. 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 There is... Um, you know, I cited him a couple of times in our book, uh, Eric Sloan, the author and illustrator Eric Sloan. And he, one of his best known books is called A Reverence for Wood. So, and I'm a woodworker. So uh, I do love, I love, you know, the grain, the appearance of old wood. Uh, now wood needs to be, it can't dry out too much. You can't let it completely dry out. But that's not hard to do. And, and of course, there's wooden furniture that is hundreds and hundreds of years old. Uh, so wood is, is the one that I would point to. I love both of those answers because I have a relationship with both of those things. I'm neither a, a tea connoisseur nor a woodworker, but I do have a relationship with both. I, one of my dear friends locally, as I, she makes journals and, um, she, I guess makes blended teas that she sells in a little shop here. And so the reason she started doing that was because both of those things, essentially got her through sort of like a, a dark night of the soul period in her life, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. uh, drink, spending time with people around tea and then journaling. And so she decided to invest her time in producing both of those things. And it wasn't so much that she was trying to sell a bunch of tea or sell a bunch of journals. It was that she wanted people to find what she found. And so she holds writing workshops uh, called Into the Woods, Mm -hmm. And she'll have these, you know, everybody brings a journal and she brews a tea and then they all go out into sort of like a nature, you know, setting and then write. She has writing exercises and they come back and share their writing every three months. And I, I just thought it was such a beautiful thing. So I've always had a special place in my heart for her because of the tea, the way she has, um, I guess, piqued my uh, awareness. Yeah. And then as yeah. far as wood... Some of my most precious objects are made of wood. I have a bunch of walking sticks and, you know, how many, how many walking sticks can a person have? But each one <laughs> comes from 
a different time in my life, you know, yes. in, a, in a different forest. And I just recently uh, made a new one. And uh, I expect it'll probably be with me another 20 years until another one comes along. But, yeah. you know, it's got the history. They all have a history to them of the time. You know, they come walked. from trees and trees are so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It's lovely. So, so you know, yeah, that's, that's beautiful. A, that's great. Love okay. those answers. All right. Let's go to question number two here. Hmm. Oh, okay. Well, this is a little personal, so let's see how y'all do with this. Possible solutions to a challenge you might be facing. Hmm. First thing, part of that is, are you facing anything challenging right now? Certainly facing our our, our second wave of, of COVID. Us too, yeah. Yeah. And it's been... You know, we're it's so many months into it, and you know, who among us imagined I know. that we were going to head all the way through the winter? So, yeah, that's. I mean, Thanksgiving coming up, uh, and it won't be the Thanksgiving that we've known. I think that's that's certainly a challenge. Yeah, agree. Um, and not being able to, in terms of Thanksgiving or other things, my husband. Um, is a great cook. He used to do it for a living, and we miss entertaining and having people in our home. And we kept looking at, well, is there any other way we can still invite people over? And the house that we bought several years ago came with a fire pit that we had never ever used. Oh wow! So we, so we started having very small groups of people, like four guests where we can spread them out on the stone fire pit. And it's been wonderful. It's a whole nother way of living in our house and being able to see the sunset and then the stars. So I guess it's look, look beyond what, what the limitation is and see if there's an, uh, see if there's a workaround. And yeah. that's turned out something it's been eight years and we'd never used the fire pit. And it's, we think we can keep this going maybe till December. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love both of those answers. It's it's got me thinking about something that I've a, a thought that's occurred to me through this time period, and especially even recently when my family was out of town, and it was um, cultivating intimacy without proximity. Mm. You know, it's sort of the challenge of our time, and it makes makes us <laughs> look at relationships. Yep. What are they made of? Are they made? And, and and maybe maybe it dives off to Ivy into some metaphysics, but. You know, are there relationships there that are um, unseen? You know, is there a connective tissue, whether it's uh, dream tissue? I mean, some one of my friends, we had a we had a dream experience not too many months ago, and it was kind of something we chuckled off. But she had used the word connective dream tissue, and I loved it. I was like, <laughs> oh, I love that word. And I, I've thought about it. I was like, yeah, so connectivity maybe isn't just bound by proximity and intimacy mm -hmm. doesn't have to be there. I mean, is love a force truly, you know, that's moving and connecting and binding and, and if it's binding us here, are there other, you know, layers that it's, it's binding us to other loves that we uh, maybe think we've lost, but we haven't really, you know, mm -hmm. loved ones and ancestors and things like that. I mean, it just got me thinking, there's something there because I felt my family, you know, and my wife and I talked about it, said I, I could feel your love when you weren't here. I could feel my children. I, mm. or at least I could feel my end of, of loving them as more mm -hmm. uh, palpable, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on my tongue almost, you know, to some degree. Mm -hmm. So that's something I think we're all going to have to do. Maybe we can, maybe that's something muscle we can grow during this time. Cause it is hard. I mean, just even kids being out of school, I feel bad because they, they're not – those relationships aren't there that, that used to give them so much joy. Just the joy of play at a park, oh, yeah. you know? Oh, yeah. It's, it's, it's different. Good answers. Gosh, I love those. Okay. Let's see. This fishbowl's working I'm, I'm, today. I'm taking notes on a lot of the things you've been saying, Oren, So, Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know what's I mean, going to come out. So. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a compliment. I mean, you're saying things that I want to be able to uh, think back on. Oh, that Well, I'm glad to hear that. I. It's always been my great hope for the show, I guess, is that uh, – and maybe just even the word show isn't right. It's really not a show. It's – 
people connecting to each other. You know, I mean, we've who knows it's if I'll ever. That's right. You know, and I feel like, again, yeah, we have a relationship now. And hopefully this has been an intimate conversation. It's very hopefully very real, you know. It is. It's been lovely. Let's see what. Gosh, my eyesight's really failing here. I can't hardly read this. Huh. Okay. This is an interesting question. What celebrity or TV show, in your opinion, set a bad example for the people of today? A bad example. Huh. I've never thought of this before. Maybe in maybe they maybe reframe this a little. Like in the context of the work you're doing with the book, is there any kind of entertainment that you think just kind of propagates the wrong thing? Like you know, rampant consumerism or uh, just a haphazard. Well, I, I guess I would say, you know, all, all that litany of game shows, you know, the game ah. shows where, you know, look what you've won. And, and uh, <laughs> yeah. because that does, it absolutely feeds into our, uh, you know, that, that very vulnerable place where I want that. I want that. I got to have it. I got to have it. Yeah. And that that feeling of I have to have something is very dangerous yeah. because then you get into the territory of, well, then I'll do anything I have to to get it. Right. Mm. That's that's very dangerous. Yeah. True. Uh, I opened up something was connected to something else on Facebook, and it was about 600 gifts or, that she'll just love for Christmas. And I scrolled through it and thought, I don't want any of this stuff. <laughs> well, did you get all the way to number 600, though? No, I quit at about 30. <laughs> and it reminded me, um, one Christmas, my dad was in the military. And one year, we were going to be moving the day after Christmas. So he didn't want to put up a Christmas tree and have to take it down. And he didn't want to have to pack a, a whole bunch of gifts. So when my sister and I came home from school, my mother said, change your clothes. Um, we, we lived in El Paso, Texas. She said, change your clothes. We're going to go out into the desert. We're going to do what? Uh, so we went across the forbidden um, emergency flight line into the open desert. And I said, why are we here? And she said, I want you to find the biggest tumbleweed you can. Why? There you go. Why? She said, I'll tell you when we get it home. Oh, wow. <laughs> so we, we, we did find one really, really big. And it took three of us to kick it home and get it over the fence. And that was our Christmas tree that year. Wow. <laughs> and we made paper ornaments to put on it. And then my mother said, and we're not going to have regular gifts this year. I said, well, what are we going to do? And she said, we're going to have experiences, not ah, something wow. that comes in a box. So we got to have horseback riding lessons on a real ranch with real cowboys. We got to go to a play, things like that. And that was probably, I was in the sixth grade that was the most memorable Christmas I ever had. And it turned out to be one of the, almost the very last that I had with my mother. Oh my goodness. Um, but what a gift that was. Oh my it's goodness. It's not about a thing that comes out of a box. It's about, she used to say when we would be transferred someplace and it was, it was just, you had to start all over again. And she would say, Elizabeth, Elizabeth, this is not a problem. We're having an adventure. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I like that. I, I have not, um, Elizabeth and I know each other pretty well. I have not heard that story before. Sixth grade, you said? Yeah. That's so glorious. Honestly, that's the kind of story. Look, I mean, that's such a such a wonderful place, and such a uh, I guess a place I didn't expect us to go. But you just made me think of the. Th of my father who's passed away and just the things that I, that I, I mean, yes, I think of objects and I think of gifts and junk that I, that's been thrown away. But ultimately, yes, one thing it made me think of, and I don't know why this is, but my dad always loved science fiction. So he would buy me like 
spaceships and Star Wars toys and things like that. And I always really looked forward to that. But what I started thinking about when you started telling that story was it wasn't the toy. I, I do like that stuff, but it was something he used to do. And he, he, I, for a long time, believed he was magic because he would... He would always like know what toy I was interested in because obviously he was watching and I wasn't aware. Mm-hmm. But then he would he would say, hmm, think of the toy you want most. And he would do something with his hands and he'd slap his hands and he'd say, now go in the other room. And I had just come from that other room. And I'm sure he and my mother had like orchestrated the whole thing. But that mm-hmm. little spaceship would be there from like Battlestar Galactic or whatever. And I believed it. I believed it fully. I mean, I was all in. You know, like a hundred percent. And what I love about it is that that's what I think we can. Your mom was cultivating like magic. You know, it's mm. kind of like made me think it's magical. It's a gift. The gift of believing that things can be good. The the gift of positive experience. I mean, gosh, what a gift for a child to have. I mean, we can have a lot of string together a lot of rotten things, but to be able to string. You know, Christmas, you know, cranberry and popcorn on a, on a thread and look at all of those strung together. What a gift. I mean, that's that's what I want to do. I'd, you're right. I'd rather give that to my kids, something they can. If my kid can sit someday and tell a story like that, like mm-hmm. you just told. Oh, it's all worth it. I mean, what a what a great thing. I love that. Mm-hmm. Well, obviously, I can still see it in my mind's eye. Yeah. I- she spray painted a flower pot with gold paint and stuck the dem- <laughs> tumbleweed in it and it had it had tissue paper stars and construction paper, whatever. And I mean, it was the most bizarre thing. And at the time, I was just, how, this isn't Christmas. And now that's the lodestar for me. Mm. The lodestar. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, this is so such a powerful way to get to the end of this episode. And I, I want to circle it back to objects, if you don't mind. It, this is probably going to be my Christmas episode now. I, I just think that's what's going to happen because I've never told this story to anybody but the people in my family. So I'm, I'm happy to share it because of what you just shared. But when I was a little boy in kindergarten... uh. We always had the best. We, I remember having the best little uh, Christmas parties. My my kindergarten teacher did a great job because I remember everything about it. I remember making the cardboard, uh, the construction paper chains for the trees and the little, you know, cranberry and popcorn and the little things the parents would make, the little reindeer candy canes, all this stuff. And I remember that year because we each got to bring an ornament for the Christmas tree. And I had this blue, it was just a a blue ball, you know, just a plain blue, shiny, mirrored ball ornament. And that was the one I wanted to bring to school. My parents let me bring it, you know, put the little wire hook and it hung on the tree. And I remember there was this little boy in our class. I'm going to call him Fred. That wasn't his name. But uh, he, his parents never came to anything and he didn't bring an ornament. And I can remember that. I was aware, at least, that he had kind of tattered. He just he looked like he wasn't cared for too well. But I remember him, and we were friends, sort of, in class. But, I, I mean, I'm, shamefully, I, I didn't play with him a lot because I kind of remember feeling like, well, he's that kid that you don't play with because mm. he's not like mm-hmm. everybody else. I just remember that, even in the uh, sure. kindergarten. Sure. That year... uh I brought that blue ornament and I remember it was our Christmas party day. And so at Christmas party day, your parents come and then they take you home mm-hmm. and his parents didn't come. Uh-huh. And, uh, we, the teacher was giving us all our little goodie bags and we each had to get our ornament off the tree. And Fred <laughs> went to the ornament and he said, Orin, he took it off the tree and he wanted that ornament. And I said, no, that's my ornament. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay. And he had this sad look on his face. And my mom made me give it to him. She said, mm-hmm. Orin, you need to give him that. Go back over mm-hmm. there. And she, I mean, I was trying to leave. And I remember my mom, like, not scolding me, but like with a quiet tone, said, no, go let that little boy have that ornament. At the time, I did not understand why. Mm-hmm. You know, I was too little. 
so I went and I gave it to him reluctantly and I was sad and kind of mad about it. You know, kindergarten, come on. Yeah. Sure. And I'm walking down the long hall. I can still see this to this day. I walk in down the long hall and he comes, Fred comes running out of the classroom all the way down the hall. I can't tell the story. I never can tell it when I tell it to my family. Anyway, he comes running down the hall and he hugged my neck so tight. I can still smell him. I can smell his shirt like now when I'm telling you this. And he said, Merry Christmas, Oren. And he was crying. You know, Matt said, Merry Christmas, Fred. So anyway, years later, I thought about that story and the details of it. And I, to this day, like we went one ever since I've uh, had a family, we have a blue ornament and that's the last ornament we put on the tree every year. We hang it at the top of the tree. It's like our star, you know, it's our, it's our Fred, Fred ornament. And it's just a gla- a blue shiny ball ornament. No, it's not. It's and not just- but yeah. it's got like that story on it. That's like love, you know. My mom, uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> she could see the right thing to do, and I couldn't because I was a kid, <laughs> a kid obviously. Yeah, yeah. But it paints my Christmas, honestly. You know, it's it's. I guess in my mind, Fred's like my little match girl. You know, I guess to That's some degree. Exactly. But it's an object, you know, and it's. Uh, I like no, it's a relic. It's a relic. <laughs> it's a relic. Yeah. Yeah. It's a relic. I like to believe that he's out. I don't know whatever. We never saw each other, you know, but I like to believe that that ornament's out there somewhere. And that when we hang that one on the tree, there's like that uh, love that ex- expands beyond proximity, I suppose. Mm-hmm. I'll bet he's remembered that to this day. Yeah. It'd be nice to, I'd, I'd like to believe that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I bet he did. Oh, That's yeah. a lovely story. I bet I would say you could count on that. What a gift. Man, guys, That's this has been good. something. That is a beautiful story. So I got one mm. last question for y'all. And this is what okay. I ask everybody at the end of the show. And it's this. Mm. Did anything good happen to you today? Mm. Well, I would say... Uh, This conversation was one of the richest conversations I've had, and I can't remember when. So we've done a fair number of um, interviews, but never one like this. This was really special, Lauren. Oh, wow. It's been special for me, too. Really. I I agree. This has been the highlight of my day. That's fantastic. Me, too. I was looking forward to this. Really was. So the folks that need to find y'all and your book and all of that how what's the best way i'm sure y'all have links and uh preferences you know, hot spots I, well, I, elizabeth i i think we'd say your local bookstore um, yes we would you know it, it's it's very easy for uh any bookstore to bring in our book if they don't already have it and uh because new world library is you know it's a mainstream publisher and they they can simply order it up you'll have it in four or five days that's excellent yeah mm-hmm. i'll um i'll tell you what i'll do i'll put a link to it on my website through um bookshop.org yeah yeah, oh, wonderful. yeah. Yes. i've heard you that's talk great. about that and we're we're also very familiar with that and that sounds great okay great yeah i think that I'm, I haven't really dug into it to make sure that those dollars are going where they say they are, but it doesn't look like there's any uh, any other reason for them to be doing the thing the way they're doing it. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so the name of the book is Repair Revolution, How Fixers Are Transforming Our Throwaway Culture. This has been John Wackman and Elizabeth Knight. Guys, what a uh, what an incredible conversation. So much heart space that I didn't really expect to get into and that just goes to show you the power of the book i mean if you are a contemplative of any kind go read this book and let it soak uh soak in your mind and uh and hey i mean honestly there's advice on how to get one of these things started right i mean in the community yeah hands on started from nothing we we went through the don't do what i did this will be a lot easier (laughs) right yeah the the title of that chapter is how do I get one of these in my town? Because That's right. Because we've been asked that question many and every times. Cafe. Yeah. How do I get one of these in my town? Yeah. I mean, and look, I mean, it's a collection of, I, I loved this part of the book, a collection of tinkerers. 
Mm. Yeah, I mean, the word tinkerer. I mean, if you want to know if you want to know the history about that, too, that's in this book. So you'll got to check that out. That was really an interesting <laughs> section. Thank you all so much. I, I just can't express uh, my gratitude. I especially with everything we're facing in the world. This this is what this show is all about. It makes me really uh, I feel blessed to have had this conversation. Thank you very much. So do I. And thank you for the opportunity. And I'm going to think about you when I hang my blue ornament on the oh, Christmas tree. Oh, please do. Wow, that's great. I'm so glad we shared those stories. Uh, me too. I'm more thankful every moment that I found. Thanks for listening to my Beacon Series conversation with John Wackman and Elizabeth Knight. If you'd like to experience their book, Repair Revolution, make sure to visit the links in the show notes. If you found something of use in this conversation, consider visiting findthegood.news slash donate, where you can help me continue this good news mission from the Louisiana Gulf Coast. I thank you for pressing play and for syncing up with this good news beacon. <laughs>